So it's funny thinking back to the uh, the long ago when we started uh, Silicon and Synapse. We really had no idea what we were doing. I will go ahead and just tell you exactly what happened. I think at the time it was probably the most violent game that had been done on Super Nintendo. It's a video game, so it's okay, right? Those early days were so pure and so simple. This thing was the bane of my existence. Alan's charter was Let's just make games and have some fun. I remember when there was a game out there that we liked, we always wanted to show that we could create something even better. It wasn't much more complicated than that. So Lost Vikings started out uh, very different than what it ended up as. Ultimately, that was a great thing. The original concept for Vikings was to create a game similar to Lemmings where you've got lots and lots of Vikings and these puzzles that you're trying to solve and the Vikings are just fodder. It was this game with hundreds of little tiny blonde haired uh eight pixel tall Vikings and it was very similar to Lemmings. It would you would have torch Vikings, you would have ladder Vikings and you would use these different type of Vikings to scale castles, uh, cross modes, defeat enemies. We found out that it was going to be very difficult to write a game that did that with a hundred Vikings. There was just too many, just too many Vikings. So we condensed it down to five units and then eventually down to three units. And that was really Lemmings plus that evolution of going from many to five to three was really the inception of the mechanics behind Lost Vikings. Can I name all three Vikings? Oh boy. Um, I have no idea. Balag the Fierce or something, or the Strong? Eric, Eric the Swift, I think. Um, Olaf, the, Olaf the Stout, Eric the Swift, and Balag, I don't remember. <laughs> I, and honestly, I don't remember, and that, that's kind of sad, but it's funny because I play it all the time. Eric the Swift, Balag the Fierce, Olaf the Stout. That's who I model myself after. <laughs> One of the challenges for the for the game Vikings was that you had to get all three characters to the end of the level. And so that meant that there was potentially a lot of having characters move across the same ground. I remember them, we were just having to brainstorm different ways that the Vikings could work together or do things on their own and what limitations they had when they were on their own. Their skill sets were so different, it made it really interesting to move these three different characters through the same level or parts of the same level. They didn't necessarily traverse exactly the same paths. There wasn't really a lot of rhyme or reason to how creating something like a level for Lost Vikings worked back then. We were trying to come up with an idea as to how we could get them in these different environments that didn't make any sense. At the time, there was a whole bunch of stuff going on about uh, alien abductions, so we had them abducted by an alien, and, and it was it was pretty funny because then we could take them and drop them into anywhere. So we could drop them into a factory zone. We could drop them into the goofy world. We could drop them into just about anywhere and everywhere. I vaguely remember showing Interplay early versions, early work in progress. They had some sort of constructive criticism for us. Interplay actually provided some help and they had an artist named Snake come over and, and redo a bunch of the artwork for us to help make it better. They came back so cute and so adorable that we're just like, yeah, okay, we, we see it. That even to this day, I think that it was probably one of the best decisions that was made. One of the things that we always try to do in our games is make sure that we are hitting on all cylinders. And humor just seemed to be another element. Like, games don't have to take themselves seriously. They can be fun as well. One thing that Blizzard's always been really good at, and one thing that we've always been really um, proud of, is the fact that we always put our own humor into the game. I think they struck a good uh, balance of fun humor, not mean humor or irreverent humor, but just kind of lighthearted fun. So this question comes up a lot. Why are there two green Vikings along with a blue one? And there's no red Viking. I don't know why there's two green Vikings, one blue one. The answer is the Super Nintendo only had a certain number of palettes. You had 256 colors maximum. We were only allowed to have 15 colors per character. Because we had so few colors to work with, if we were to add more colors to a Viking, we'd have to take those colors away from somewhere else. What we did though was in Heroes of the Storm when we brought back the Lost Vikings we introduced that blue color scheme for Olaf. So if you look at it now, you have Eric with his sort of red, you have Balog in the green, and you have Olaf in the blue. 
Back then you could make a game start to finish in just a few months with four or five people. That led to this proliferation of lots of different game types and that was sort of the environment that we grew up in. When people saw Lost Vikings and then looked at Rock and Racing, they go, those games are so widely different. Why did they change? And then when we put Blackthorn out, then they were really confused. It's like, what is going on? In all honesty, we were just trying to do things that we, loved, that we wanted to play. We didn't want to create the same thing. We were playing lots of different games. We wanted to create lots of different games. If you spend all day long working on the game, and then before you go home, what you want to do instead of going home is play the game some, you know you're working on a hit. And that was what it was like with Rock and Roll Racing. Let the carnage begin! Rock and Roll Racing actually is sort of the spiritual sequel to a game we made called RPM Racing. RPM Racing was actually a game that Alan Adham had done by himself. So Interplay had asked Alan to make a sequel to it, and that's where I believe Silicon and Synapse was actually born from, was to build a team to make Rock and Roll Racing and do other games. Boozer didn't make Rock and Roll Racing. Bob Fitch did. Bob told me to say that too. I think he's going to give me a cool 20 bucks for that. I started rock and roll racing very close to the beginning. Uh, in fact, I got to do most of the code associated with that, so that was fun. RPM Racing was a good racing game, um, but it didn't have a, a tremendous amount of personality. When we uh, started talking about our rock and roll racing, we started to talk about making the tracks bigger, about putting weapons on the cars, different lasers and rockets and all this other stuff on because who doesn't like to blow things up? In, in a video game, it's fun to blow things up because there's no real ramifications. Ivan should avoid mine. We pushed it from a normal racing game on boring dirt tracks to racing in outer space, right? To we're racing on inferno planets with aliens, you know, blasting away at you. And that was just the sort of birth of when, what Blizzard did with all of the games, what we did to fantasy and sci-fi and horror was all started back in those little games that took a year to make and we were just kind of having fun with it. We didn't look at it as we were trying to be radically different. We were saying, hey, we can do whatever we want. Let's do it. And I think that set the tone for future Blizzard games. One of the innovations of rock and roll racing was putting real rock and roll music into the game. The goal was to just pick really recognizable classic rock songs that would uh, that added an element of excitement to the experience. The first musician we contacted was actually ZZ Top and the price tag basically for us to be able to get them was was prohibitive. And then we contacted a uh, music service that provides sort of low-cost licensed music in public settings. We licensed, I think, about a half a dozen songs at a reasonable price, and we were able to adapt them into the hardware at the time. It was like peanut butter and chocolate. It was just perfect. Catch about to blow! One of the things we got for Rock and Roll Racing that was really, I thought was very lucky, was get Larry Huffman to come and do the actual calling of the races. The stage is set, the green flag drops! He used to do the announcing for uh, Speedway over at the Orange County Fairgrounds. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Come on down to the something raceway. <laughs> I don't remember anything else beyond that. The idea of putting voice in there, like a race caller's voice into the game, seemed really obvious. Why aren't more people doing this? There are several technical challenges. I mean, the first was there wasn't a whole lot of space on the, on the cartridge for things like uh, audio clips. And so we really had to pick and choose the ones we could get on there and make sure that they were compressed so that they didn't take much space. And then after that, it just became a question of, a little bit of sort of intelligent AI to figure out when to say the line so it sounded natural. If something happened in the game and I wanted to highlight it, then I would just call one of the little clips. I would just either pick them randomly or have one associated with a particular action. Rip jams into first. Make scores a first place knockout. We wanted to have more speed or a better sense of speed going from RPM racing to rock and roll racing. And I think the biggest thing we did there 
was increased the size of the track. Believe it or not, somehow that helped. I also sped up the cars. I literally made them travel faster. That brings its own set of challenges because then when you're doing collision detection on the edges of the track and with other cars, uh, you have to handle the case where you've moved well past the edge and try and figure out where the car should have been. Uh, so it required a lot of additional work on Bob's part. I think the introduction of heavy metal music really helped pick up the speed of the game. It might have been that they made the cars faster, but I'm gonna stick with the heavy metal thing. Heavy metal makes you go faster. Blake is dominating the race! Rip them! We done Lost Vikings, we done Rock and Roll Racing, those were both really tongue in cheek. We just wanted to try our hand at something a little bit different. Kyle's there, he's got his shotgun, and that was what the whole game was about. It was this lone guy going through the world, you know, shooting things up. Blackthorn was even a little bit heavier and a little bit darker to begin with, but we changed it around a bit because it was just feeling too heavy. When you're playing a console game, you're not really looking to play a super serious story game. You wanna have fun. We had just come off of rock and roll racing where you play with your buddies and have fun. And then you got this game where it's like, children are missing. It's getting worse and you're like, oh man, this is getting heavy. Let's, let's, let's like lighten it up a little bit. I mean, you can still have a shotgun, right? But uh, let's tone down on the dark stuff. Blackthorn's story was the beginning, sort of, of Blizzard learning to tell stories. We start to kind of take ourselves a little bit serious in, in our writing and how we think about stories and character development. Blackthorn was our first anti-hero. He was a hero, but he was kind of a bad guy or a tough guy, or he played on the, the darker side of the street, right? So you can see a little bit of the elements of Blackthorn in characters like Illidan, and characters like Arthas. Jim Rayner is kind of Blackthorn-esque. The idea for Blackthorn came from a couple other games that were among the first to use rotoscoping. And one of them was, uh, it's called Out of This World. And there was another game that followed on called Flashback. And seeing those games uh, really like was something we felt like, hey, we can do that too. We can make a game that looks like that and has those kinds of sensibilities. I remember seeing that and just thinking, oh my God, these the, the animations are so lifelike. They're amazing. Had never seen anything like that before. I remember they wanted the animations to look uh, really fluid. They really wanted to get that nice, kind of just smooth motion. And so what they did is they filmed us doing the various actions of the character in the game with a, you know, a broom or a stick for the gun. And people were running around with guns and crawling and you know dodging and ducking uh, with, with uh, different implements in their hand to simulate what gun combat would look like. It was hilarious. I think I tried to do some like forward rolls or something at one point, but uh, I don't know that that worked very well. <laughs> it seems like a great uh, like cost savings. Hey, we'll just record people. But really, it was an enormous amount of work for the artists to take that video and convert it into something that could be used for the game. We would go through this elaborate process to, to cut out the character, and then we would take those frames and we would draw over them meticulously with the 15 colors that we were allowed. And what we ended up doing was Instead of rotoscoping, we said, how many frames does this character have to do? Oh, 16? Okay, we'll just do a 16 frame animation and we'll just kind of put that rotoscoping stuff to the side. Uh, we did it once or twice. It was the biggest pain in the butt. And then we figured out, we're just gonna do it ourselves. <laughs> The names of the characters in Blackthorn are they're a little random. Thoros and Salak and all this and then Kyle. Why Kyle? Don't really know why we chose to call him Kyle. We had talked about some 80s action movies before and uh, you might remember a little one called, I don't know, Terminator. Uh, there was Kyle Reese. He was sent from a future time to the present time to save Sierra Kana. Uh, so when we were making this game, we thought Kyle was a cool sounding name. Kyle's a perfectly normal name for a, you know, a guy with a shotgun from Earth. One of the things about Blackthorn that's kind of cool is this the first time that we actually had orcs. I don't know if you remember it, 
but there would be the little bad guys that you fought, and then when they shot you, they would go, ha, 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 ha. The orcs at that time just became so dear to us also because they were always just there to add a little bit of humor to what was going on in a very dark story. That's a fun little uh, side note, I think, that many people wouldn't have known, is that the first Blizzard orcs were in Blackthorn. Now, wait a minute, I'm actually thinking, I think our first orc might have actually been in Rock and Roll Racing as one of the bad guys that you play against. I think it was Bogmire. So, Blizzard and orcs, since 1993. When I think about Lost Vikings, Rock and Roll Racing, and Blackthorn, I can't really say that I have a favorite game. Rock and Roll Racing is by far my favorite. Lost Vikings is definitely my favorite. They're all pretty different from each other, too, which makes it hard to choose. Rock and Roll Racing is my favorite. My favorite was Lost Vikings. I have to admit that my favorite game, still to this day, is Lost Vikings. I love them all equally.